Oh, hi, hello. Usually we have a big thing that plays before, but not tonight. Just before they go, hey, it's not playing, be ready. I'm ready. Hopefully you are. Thanks for being with us. This is the story. I am Dan Haggerty. Uh, it's probably a good thing that we're coming in kind of a little bit more quietly tonight because this first story is a pretty heavy one. See, we get a lot of viewer comments and emails on this show on all kinds of topics. And I ask every night, as I will tonight, for you to continue to send them in. You use the hashtag HeyDan on Twitter, or you email us at the story at KGW.com. And our, our, our team will follow up on as many as we can. But we want to start tonight with one email that really grabbed our attention right away. Brooke wrote in. And Brooke said, I would like to see a showcase about the homeless encampment that is located around the perimeter of Lone Fir Cemetery. It has grown quite large. Then she added, my young daughter is buried in that cemetery, and I no longer feel safe visiting her gra gravesite due to trash and urine and feces in public, etc. So we called Brooke as soon as we read that. She told us she is a Portland native, and she knows this city, her city, has a massive housing shortage. It's a crisis. And Brooke said that she feels for the people who live on our streets. But in this case, she's hoping that the city can frankly draw a line and do whatever is necessary to protect a sacred space for her grieving family. Here's Maggie Vespa. Sometimes we feel like we made a mistake by choosing this cemetery. Um, and we don't want to feel like that because this, she's here. This is, this is where we chose her for a reason in the beginning. Brooke Lee is a pretty private person who's invited cameras to an incredibly personal space. She wants you to see what her family sees when they come to visit their baby girl. Arwen Lisa Lee died in 2017. Born at 24 and a half weeks and weighing less than a pound, doctors diagnosed her with a lung infection. She was in the NICU and she came down with the infection and we lost her on Mother's Day. Lee took this photo at Arwen's funeral. The family buried her at Southeast Portland's Lone Fir Cemetery. Lee has other family here. It was an easy choice. But about a year ago, she says something changed. A homeless camp appeared outside Lone Fir's gates. It started small and steadily grew. Within the last couple of months, things have changed. Lee says she's seen people urinating and defecating inside the cemetery. And on next door, she says others have reported campers brandishing knives. Lee says she didn't want to show us Arwen's grave because she's afraid of it getting vandalized. She's hoping someone can step in, and she's not the only one. Monday, the Oregonian published a letter to the editor about Lone Fur, another woman writing, is there no consideration for families attending a funeral? There is nowhere to park now. Something definitely needs to be done about this. Families come here to grieve, and we need this cemetery to remain a safe haven. To understand what could happen, you should know two governing agencies have jurisdiction here. Metro over the cemetery itself, the city of Portland over the sidewalk and street. KGW reached out to both. Metro declined to comment, only saying this camp is on city property. And Tuesday we saw the city had posted notices promising to clear the camp last week, but that never happened. Via email, a spokesperson blamed the heat wave, writing, staff intend on completing this project by the end end of the week or beginning of next week. I grew up in this neighborhood, so um, that, um, and I love the cemetery. Campers we talked to didn't deny any of Lee's claims. They feel bad anyone's nervous visiting Lone Fur. We look a lot scarier. I think normally homeless people um, look a lot scarier uh, than they actually are, but I mean, it's good to be safe too. Lee told us she's not trying to villainize anyone. She's a Portland native and knows her city has a housing crisis. She also knows her husband and two young sons used to visit Arwen's grave together. Now they're afraid to bring the kids. So Lee and her husband come in shifts. The place that we chose to bury her is no longer a safe haven for her. Okay, Maggie Vespa, joining us now so our hearts obviously go out to this family and any family who's lost a loved one especially a child 
Do we know more, though, about what's next for this cemetery? Well, just that the camp is slated, as we said, to be cleared by early next week. Now, that said, camps, as we know, are cleared all the time, only to come right back to that same spot. So, of course, Dan, that could happen in this case. And now people who we talk to, we talk to people out on the street there, they, they say that's partially, partly because they have nowhere for those people to go. So to that end, the city's been promising this big permanent solution. They're calling them safe rest villages. Do we have any update on those? Yeah, this has been a big headline. Well, no update yet. We've been asking, but we still haven't gotten the exact locations, the addresses of where these would go. But you're right. The city is promising to open six safe rest villages in Portland by the end of the year. And the plan is to give people a place where they can camp legally. And William, in our story tonight, who you just saw, said he would go there if that was an option. But it's not an option yet. So the cycle of clearing camps in Portland continues. And stories like Brooks shows this crisis weighs on everyone in one form or another. Exactly. Maggie, thank you. Sure. Now, let's turn to the big story and talk about the cost of COVID physical, emotional, and financial. Now we've really, we've really drilled down on those first two a lot over the last year and a half. And if you don't understand the physical and emotional tolls of this virus, then this show probably isn't your primary source of news. So let me be the first to thank you for turning away from your uncle's anti-vax Facebook post for long enough to catch an episode of our little newscast. And I'd like to start with the financial toll. Because the only thing scarier than being dead in America is being broke in America. I'm kidding, but COVID can do both. And we talk a whole lot more about the being dead part than the being broke part. I got this email from a viewer last week. They asked, when an individual gets hospitalized with COVID, how much is their personal medical cost? Maybe if you show that there is some personal financial incentive to getting vaccinated and not getting hospitalized, it will prompt some to get the shot. Now, it probably will not surprise you that there is no simple equation here or answer to this question. I mean, consider the variables just off the top of your head. I mean, are you insured for one? You are, okay, what type of insurance? Is it through an employer or is it through a government system like Medicare? What's your deductible? Is it a big deductible, a little one? Um, what about the care you received? In network, out of network? Is your medication covered? Lots of questions. Healthcare in America is different for every American. There are so many vari variables that it, uh, answering a question like how much will COVID cost you is kind of impossible to answer, but I will try. I found a study by Fair Health, a nonprofit that compiled data from insurance providers to try and figure out how much COVID costs patients on average. So for people without insurance, no insurance, if you get admitted into the hospital, it will cost you about $73,000. For people with insurance, your provider on average will be billed about $38,000 and then you will pay an amount consistent with your plan. The average deductible is roughly $1,400 in this country. To which insured people might say, well, that doesn't sound so bad, except it doesn't count the cost of medication, surprise bills for anything that was done out of network, or long-term care for lingering symptoms or other problems exacerbated by COVID. That said, it is clearly better to be insured than to not be insured. If an uninsured person stays in the hospital for more than five days, and many do, the cost jumps to more than $100,000. If you're in the hospital for longer, let's say more than 10 days, the average cost jumps to more than 300,000. And if you're in the hospital for 15 days or more, and you know, a lot of people are, they're in there for a while, the sky's the limit. I mean, the average cost ranges between 500000 and a million dollars. So at a million bucks, if you can afford a payment of, let's say, 1000 bucks a month, you should have that puppy paid off in about 83 years with a no interest loan. Let me know if you get one of those. Now, if at any point a person goes into the ICU, that's when the big bucks start being spent. If you have a breathing tube, the cost jumps even higher. Intubation is very expensive, but fortunately, there is an almost foolproof way to avoid that cost. Get vaccinated. This week, we talked to Jamie Penny. He's a COVID ICU nurse at OHSU, where he's worked for the last 10 years. And right now, the ICU there is spilling over with COVID patients. He says this is the worst he has seen it, even compared to the early days when we were still learning how to treat COVID. And all of the patients currently in his ICU have one thing in common. None of them were vaccinated. None. It is so sad because it's 100% preventable. It's, it's just sad and it's heartbreaking and people don't see it. Um, but, you know, and the other thing about this particular wave is that um, 
the Delta variant goes after younger people. And so we're seeing way younger patients, some with no pre-existing conditions. Um, and so knowing that it's preventable and it's, you know, attacking younger people and making, if it's not killing them, it's actually, you know, creating long-term disability in people that were otherwise healthy, you know, fathers, um, like young fathers, uh, young people with their whole lives ahead of them. So, as if you needed another example to get vaccinated, don't just think about your life and your health and your family, but consider your portfolio. A COVID vaccine is a pretty good investment. You're less likely to get sick. You're less likely to have lingering effects. You're less likely to get admitted to the hospital. You're much less likely to land in the ICU and a lot less likely to go broke from a virus that we have a vaccine for. Now, if you have questions about the vaccine, I know a lot of you still do. If you want us uh, to consider something, maybe in this topic, or uh, to read up on something you don't think we are. Maybe it's even something you saw on Facebook or Instagram that you think we should be considering. Please send it our way. I know a lot of people who don't have the vaccine think that we don't take those claims seriously, but we do. And when they're not true, we debunk them because we want you to make informed decisions about your health. Now, speaking of vaccines, why don't we count them? We like to do that to show how many people are vaccinated. So let's take a look. More than 2.62 million Oregonians have gotten at least their first dose. That's about a little more than 62% of the entire state's population. So that's everybody. That includes everyone, even kids under 12 who can't get the vaccine yet. In Washington, more than 5 million people have gotten at least their first dose. That week works out to be about 66% almost of the state's entire population, including kids. So again, there's still a lot of people who aren't vaccinated in both states. I want to talk about a story now that we think is worth your time. So do you remember former Oregon State Representative Mike Nearman's Operation Hall Pass? Well, OPB got a hold of the Oregon State Police investigation into everything that happened with that operation. Quick refresher if you need it. Surveillance video caught Nearman opening the side door of the state capitol to right wing demonstrators during a one day special session last December and things got ugly. They eventually got pushed back out by state troopers. Then another video emerged showing Nearman describing his entire plan to let people in the Capitol to people who text him. He called this Operation Hall Pass and gave out his phone number to a crowd. Very covert. Well, after all of that, Nearman got both expelled from the legislature and convicted of a criminal misconduct charge. But through this whole ordeal, we've been curious. I've been wondering about those text messages. I mean, who texted Nearman to get into the building? What did they say? How did he respond? Well, thanks to OPB, now we know. Oregon State Police got a search warrant for Nearman's phone. On the morning of December 21st, which was the day of that special session, Nearman got a text from a man named Quincy Franklin. He's a conservative activist who live streamed the video of Nearman talking about Operation Hall Pass. Franklin texted Nearman, Mike, this is Quincy. What door do we come in? Nearman responded, West door, just to the side of the main entrance. Okay. Then Nearman got a text from a woman named Terry Stafford. Now this spring, she was elected to the Malala River School Board. She wrote, we are here. Which door shall we go to? I like the use of the word shall. Nearman responded, just west of the main entrance where they have, a mo have the monitor. Do they have a person there? Stafford wrote, we have people at the front entrance. I don't know one from the next. And Nearman responded, okay. So we sent a message to Stafford asking her about this, asking if she shall respond to us, to which she said, please do not reach out again. We also reached out to the school district, but haven't heard back. Now, Oregon kids are set to go back to school in a couple of weeks, and it'll be a big change from last year's mostly virtual at-home classes. But while they were at home, some parents say that they were a bit surprised to overhear some of the things their kids were learning. Now, you've probably heard the term critical race theory a lot being tossed around. We've talked about it on the show from time to time, but unless your kid is going into some graduate level seminar, it's, it's highly unlikely they're going to be actually taught critical race theory in their classroom. Let's review. Critical race theory is a framework meant to examine the way that racism is woven into the nation's history and the way the policies that we have in place right now perpetuate that. 
But there's been this pushback in school districts across the country to ban CRT, critical race theory, in public schools. We talk with officials in the Salem-Kaiser School District and they say they've gotten a lot of calls recently from worried parents. There are some misconceptions about what uh, critical race theory is. Um, for, for many, I think the biggest misconception is that it's a, it's a curriculum, which it isn't a curriculum within our schools. And also another misconception is that it's a white shaming or a white guilting um, curriculum that we're teaching. Um, it's, it's not that. Uh, what it intends to do is, again, to show a theory that's connected to um, race and race relations within the context of our history. But within our schools, um, we don't teach critical race theory per se. What we really try to do is um, celebrate um, race and diversity and ethnic diversity within our schools. It doesn't mean that there's not elements of CRT that um, have been influential within our schools. It's, it's been a very well-known doctrine for the last 20 years. And so it does have influence in, in schools. Now, your kids are going to learn about cultural diversity and about races. Salem Kaiser says they realized a few years ago that their curriculum specifically didn't exactly represent the student body that they had. In that district alone, there are more than 80 languages that are spoken. About half of the students are ethnically diverse. If you have any questions about what your students are learning, because, you know, maybe it's not the way you were taught, or maybe you're just unsure about it and you want some more specifics, ask your kid's school. Give them a call. Talk to them about it. Ask the teacher or ask us and we'll try and find out what we can for you. Use that hashtag, hey Dan. We've spent a lot of time on this show talking about the damage left behind by last summer's devastating wildfires. And it's gonna take more than a year to, I don't know, have our normal lives back. But while homes and businesses are getting rebuilt, survivors are still suffering. Emotionally, it's been really hard. Um, not only for myself, but for my daughter when the story continues. Hey, I want to thank everybody for trusting us with some of the questions that you have about the COVID vaccine. People who, you know, people who are still on the fence, despite a lot of the science and fact that we have kind of 
said night after night on this show. But I do want to address the specific questions. I think, I think it's so important for everybody to, to come to the conclusion on their own. Of course, I think you can assume what conclusion I think that should be. But we'll continue to answer your questions the best we can. So please keep trusting us with them, and we'll keep, we'll keep getting, getting you the answers based in fact. Welcome back. Hi. I do always go through the questions and comments during the break, so please keep sending them to the story at kgw.com or use that hashtag HeyDan on Twitter. And I also want to remind you about our Hey Help campaign. So this week, we're asking you to consider donating to Mudbone Grown. They're a black-owned farm enterprise that helps people of color get into the farming and agriculture industry. It's a great cause. If you'd like to donate, just point the camera on your phone at the QR code you see on your screen. That'll take you to a link where you can donate, or you can go to kgw.com slash heyhelp. All this week, we're going to be partnering with our sister stations on the West Coast for a series we're calling Scorched Earth. We're taking a look at the impacts of wildfires, not only on our landscape, but on the mental and emotional well-being of the people who live through them. It's something a lot of people in Oregon know pretty well, right? Especially after last year. Christine Pitawanich went to Southern Oregon to check in on people who survived one of the most destructive fires of 2020. The fires that burned in Oregon in 2020 were unprecedented. In talent, almost a year later, there are still piles of rubble. They're reminders of the 1.2 million acres burned across the state and more than 5,000 homes and buildings that were destroyed. Over half of those homes, 2,500, burned to the ground in one county. I had to rush and get both kids in the car. And I still remember like it was yesterday, I was shaking, my daughter was crying, mommy, what's going on, what's going on? And I was shaking, I just kept telling myself, it's gonna be okay, it's gonna be okay, as I was shaking. The memory of the Almeda fire that tore through communities in Southern Oregon almost a year ago is still fresh. And the impact on Anna Pantoja's family is immeasurable. Emotionally, it's been really hard. Um, not only for myself, but for my daughter. Her daughter, Genesis, is just six, diagnosed with PTSD from the fire. So she's in therapy now. Um, I'm in therapy. These days, Pantoja says her anxiety is easily triggered, especially with the stress of finding stable housing and trying to get help from FEMA. Other fire survivors, like Anna D'Amato, are also having a tough time. When it gets smoky or there, the temperature gets a certain way and the winds start blowing the way it was that day, we sort of go back to that day and like, oh, is it gonna happen again? Can it happen again? D'Amato says mentally, she's just not the same. I find it's, it's still hard to focus sometimes. And there are things that I really can't remember before the fire. The anxiety also extends to first responders in the area. Before we would expect to run a call, but now we're like, we're not just expecting to run a call, we're almost expecting the worst every time. I'm a captain here at Fire District 5. Aaron Bustard with Jackson County Fire District 5 remembers the Almeda fire moving quickly, fueled by dry vegetation and strong wind. It was kind of overwhelming because we never seen anything like it. On staff that day, were just nine firefighters. I had asked, I was like, you know, when are the resources getting here? And we were just told there's, there's nothing coming. It felt pretty defeating. The lack of resources due to multiple fires burning across Oregon. It, it was frustrating, you know, and very frustrating not being able to do something. You know, we still look at areas of our community that residents haven't been able to come back to. In the end, roughly 2,500 homes burned in the Almeda fire. Add to the constant reminders of what happened, the guilt many first responders feel. I mean, we all felt so bad about what happened and we felt, you know, we felt almost like we failed. But Bustard says mental health resources through the firefighters union helped a lot. And there are other resources, one of them, the Red Cross, which has licensed mental health professionals who volunteer their time responding to disasters across the U.S. We have about 15 active disaster mental health professionals, uh, volunteers in the Oregon and Southwest Washington area. And then nationally, um, there are several hundred. During last year's fires, we probably had 
maybe 30 or 35 folks from other states coming in to help us, rotating in and out. Carol Gross says the Red Cross often works with county mental health resources, and FEMA also provides mental health help. Over the past year, FEMA allocated more than $3 million for crisis counseling in Oregon alone. A year-round resource is the Disaster Distress Line, the number right there on your screen, 1-800-985-5990. It's open 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for anyone dealing with a disaster or the aftermath of one. It's got counselors who can cater to more than 100 different languages. Back in Southern Oregon, D'Amato, who is also also a trained therapist, is now rebuilding her home. Her familiarity with trauma and mental health has helped her get through tough times. Stopping and taking some really deep breaths. Do you do four or five of those and you really can feel the anxiety and the stress sort of leaving your body? So that's one thing, going for a walk, talking to friends. Pantoja hasn't found a technique that works for her quite yet, but she finds comfort in being prepared. We're ready. We, we have all the important documents and we know where they're at. For now, she's still dealing with the mental and emotional fallout associated with the fire, and she knows it'll be a long road. And it's going to take more than a year to, I don't know, have our normal lives back. In Southern Oregon, Christine Podawanich, KGW News. Nice uh, story from Christine there. All right, keep sending in our, uh, your questions and your comments. Use that hashtag, hey Dan, I'm going to read a few when we finish the story. Next. All right, a couple of questions Robert wanted to know. Maybe allocate only a percentage of the ICU beds to COVID patients. Why do they get all the ICU beds? Because they're dying of COVID. Because they're, they're people who are dying. If, if you don't give them the ICU bed, they're going to die. So um, imagine that news story, right? They're leaving empty beds and people are dying in the hallways, right? Uh, that's not going to happen. If people have COVID and they need to go into the ICU, they're going to go into the ICU. It just so happens that a lot of people are going into the ICU with COVID because for the most part, they're not getting vaccinated. Um, what else we got? So uh, Greg wrote in and said, I thought way back in May, we had reached 70% immunity. 
or you know, 70% of people had been vaccinated. Kind of goes along with a, another thing that I got from Pat. He said, you ignored it again. It's your job to report the facts. I feel like your job is to supply alternative facts. How many people have been vaccinated in the category of people who are supposed to be vaccinated? So the reason we changed that, it was back um, when we were getting ready to reopen the state. They wanted to reach that 70% of people with at least one shot in the eligible group for a vaccine. But we don't count that number anymore, okay? Because the number of people being vaccinated has dropped or plateaued and, and we're not seeing any big increases. We're looking at the total population who is unvaccinated. So that's counting kids and everybody because we know that the virus is spreading with kids. We know that kids are going back to school and that there's a big risk of them spreading the, the virus between each other and then bringing it back to their families, to people who may be unvaccinated. So we're looking at the total population because that is what COVID looks at. It doesn't care if you are 18 or older, 16 or older, it doesn't care. It's going to infect everybody who it wants to. That's the way it goes. So that's how we're going to continue to, to cover it. No alternative facts, just some clarity on the way we want to give that information. That makes sense, right? If you have a problem with it, let me know. Use the hashtag HeyDan. It's part of the show. Thanks for being with us. See you tomorrow.